What does it mean to live together? On this land? In, in this, this place? place? Burnt Thicket Theatre presents We, we Treaty, Treaty People. People. Audio dramas exploring what it means to embrace all our relations. Welcome back for our conversation with the artists from last episode. Land. My name is Yvette Nolan, and I'm the production dramaturge for We Treaty People. My name is Stephen Walchmet. I'm the artistic director of Burnt Thicket Theatre. Part of my personal journey in recent years has been about learning to see the history of Canada from Indigenous perspectives and unlearning cultural assumptions and practices I've received in my Eurocentric heritage. Of course, this learning and unlearning are ongoing. As a company, Burnt Thicket is seeking to respond to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action number 83, to support good ways for Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists to collaborate in making theatre that contributes to reconciliation in these lands called Canada. In our live shows after a curtain call, we encourage audiences and artists to engage with each other, with the story, and with their real lives outside the theatre. Given that these are digital performances, we hope this conversation with the artists will expand your reflection about the play. We'd like to invite you to learn more. Check out the resources and suggestions in the episode description and our website. We encourage you to talk about the play with your friends, to chat with us on Facebook, or in our virtual talkbacks on Zoom. Or by leaving a response on our website. We want to hear what you think. And now, recorded on Treaty 6 territory, we bring you a conversation with the artists from Land. Well, again, thanks everybody. This was this is fun, and this is the final recording, and it's been really great to be be doing this. We've really enjoyed the project, but uh, to focus on this script and and this production we just did, I'm just gonna. Welcome everybody to in, uh, introduce themselves and what your role was in this audio play, and we'll go we'll go this way. I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Tim Bratton, and I was the recorder and sound designer for this show. I'm Lancelot Knight, and I read for Benjamin. Oh, my name is Ken McLeod, and I was the director. I'm Stephen Walchmed, and I'm the playwright. I'm Abby Thiessen, and I was Melissa, the farmer. I'm Louise Happ. My role was to play the um, Nukum, which is my grandmother, Kukum, which means your grandmother, uh, the voice behind the grandma. I'm Julissa Campos, and I was the stage manager. I'm Kent Allen. I played Albert, the tall, handsome person in this radio play. It's great here. Well, thanks, everybody. And here we're going to ask a question just to start us off, and it's a question that we'll all answer here and that we'll invite uh, people who are listening to, to think of for themselves. And it's, it's this. What surprised you as you, as you experienced um, this play, Land? Or is there a line or an image from the play that's stuck with you? What surprised me was the respect that Stephen took and um, the knowledge that he gave out to really actually break down what treaty rights are. Because you often are part of Indigenous plays and when they're written by the majority, there's a lot of like blank spots, but I, I could tell that Stephen really took this serious and brought knowledge to this play. And I'm always surprised when I see someone come with something with such respect. There was something else, but I forgot it. We can come back around too, so yeah. no <clears throat> And we don't have to go in order. Oh, oh, oh good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, do you know there's, there's yes, one, Ken, we're looking at you. <laughs> there's, there's one word in this piece that, uh, and it has occurred before when I hear a story. It means... Uh, 
I, I think for many, uh, there's a beginning, middle, and end. We've come to think of stories as very confined sorts of things. But when we refer to story in a play like this, the story is ongoing. It goes way into the past and it goes way into the future. And I think we sort of have to look at that word in terms of the relationship in an entirely different way than we are perhaps habitually accustomed to. So that, I find that very fascinating. It's Yeah, to touch on that, I mean, because the past and the future are like basically the same thing. If you look at like where we are now, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it's what this whole concept of the play is. is it's about, to me, how these things have been hidden. And like you said, it's all one thing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's how we have, it's how we think of it and how we need to re-examine uh, the process of thinking about story and how we're involved in the story, personally involved in the story. Something that, um, to go in a, a slightly different direction, for me, I was involved with this piece a, a, a little bit further back uh, which is I got to uh, sort of witness a few different drafts of this of this story as it was coming forward, and um, a curiosity in in that sort of it being an educational tool, and, and as story was woven out of that to really find relationships. So I mean, I think it's I I hope it's fair to say in earlier drafts it was really um, it was educational. And the voices felt like they were teaching you something specifically. And then through uh, some drafts and some conversations, it really started to just be what felt like a more natural conversation between actual humans as they could speak their minds and uh, educate in a way through story. And, and, and I say that in, in, in my experiences with um, some elders and, and elders teachings is that 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 it wasn't about a lesson it was about a story and that the onus is on the hearer to hear the to hear the lesson in the story and i think that's something that was achieved through the process of this show was that the now the lesson can be heard in the story rather than you going uh a lesson that was me putting my head back onto the couch and <laughs> using disdain <laughs> I'm, I'm an audio actor. <laughs> uh. <laughs> just out visually. <laughs> no, you're right on that sense of like it, it like the first drafts. Um, it, it like I think I made a comment of like it came down to like it almost felt like when Cookham came to talk about the treaty rights, it kind of felt like it was like sit down, put your hand up, raise. This is an education thing, mm -hmm. and uh, it really speaks to the, the talent of Stephen for him to take those really important things about the treaty rights that they are not contracts they're actually the law of this land you know and if anything you missed is like the the it's the thing that no one understands is that every non-indigenous person is treaty everybody in canada is treaty we're all treaty and the problematic part about that is i have to have a card mm -hmm. I am assigned a number, it's just not tattooed on me. And, but it is law, and it's, it, he brings up some very good points of the Indian Act. Right now there's this movement going on of burn the Indian Act. And when I read that line, and when you said, when, when Cookham says, no, that's the only thing protecting us. You know, that would be an interesting exploration because what I hear from the community is get rid of the Indian Act because it's so uh, patriarchal and uh, very colonized of the people. So, but I'm, I'm intrigued. Well, for me, it was very educational. Like I didn't know about the crown, only the land or, or about anything, the treaty. As, as someone who immigrated here, it's just everything is just so new and I'm every, every day I'm learning. I am, um, yeah, I, trying to understand more about the history because we have history too, but it's it's different. Our relationship with indigenous people is slightly bit different than the way it was. It, it is here in Canada, so yeah, it, it's it. I really learned a lot, and I like the fact that you said Canada. Well, it's a story, educational story. It didn't feel like I was being taught, but I felt like I learned from the story that you created. 
I think this is a good point then to, to get Steve now for you to say, okay, well, what was the inspiration? And I know kind of the answer to this, but what was your inspiration for writing this script? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I feel like I need to make a disclaimer because I, I have a long and like uh, tumultuous relationship with theater that wants to educate and you can create propaganda and you can do that for all sorts of, you know, I don't know. Questionable reasons? Questionable <laughs> reasons, right, right. Yeah, yeah like, like using art as a tool is, is really fraught and, and not yeah. helpful. But as we've been working on this, we treat people project, been on a learning journey my, myself, like personally, but particularly with this, this audio series project, I wanted to, like, what else can I learn so that I can, so I can be more respectful and less ignorant in working with my indigenous friends and fellow artists and, and you know, and trying to anticipate what are the yeah, but, well, yeah, but, sure, yeah, but we're all treating people, but yeah. What about this? I, I want to learn how to how to respond to friends and family members who maybe don't see things the way I do. And uh, last fall, my father-in-law put me onto this book by Bob Joseph called 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act, which was really eye-opening for me. And um, particularly the, the details about the Crown actually owning reserve land and and, and yeah, why can't we just get rid of the Indian Act and some some of some of those specifics? And then ha happened to uh, have a chance to, to listen to Ray Aldred, who's a Northern Cree elder and professor at, at UBC's uh, Vancouver School of Theology, and uh, just experiencing his teaching about Indigenous culture and its relationship with European descent cultures and and even with with Christianity. He taught about treaty as an adoption ceremony, and the the familial like the, the now we're all family. The way he talked about that, just kind of, well, it, it inspired me. But it, but but it also was like, oh, cool. That's what that's sort of what we want to like poke at with this series, and and uh, brought that to Yvette and to Tim, and was like, this is so cool. What if we had a script like this, you know, and, and, and in that conversation, Tim and Yvette kind of said, I think you need to write that, Steve. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not really a playwright. I mean, I used to dabble in it. I'm, you know, they're like, no, I think you, why don't we, we'll be, you know, at the table with you dramaturgically, and then we brought Ken into it, too. And, um, yeah, and, and Yvette said, you know, as the artistic director helping to produce this series, it's great to make space for all these other voices that aren't necessarily like within the staff or whatever, but, but what are we saying? Or like, Steve, what do you, Stephen, what do you want to say? You know, and you need some skin, skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, uh, it, it's a bigger project and longer process than I think I anticipated. And, and certainly the earlier drafts felt a lot more education I'll throw your head back <laughs> Did -did didactic <laughs> but I just really appreciate like everybody's input in in helping this the script become a story rather than uh, an educational piece you know yeah. and uh, including the cast because I mean I mean the the rehearsals have been script workshops too and everybody's feedback has been really helpful and collaborative yeah I want to move on and ask our next question. I'm going to ask it with, with the addendum right built into it, and it's, it's this. It's an important question we've asked every group of, of artists that's joined us in the circle, and it's, it's this question of how are you connected to the land and to the communities around you? And I'm just going to ask it this way. You might also want to go further and say, well, this is how it could be better connected. So how are you connected to the land, to communities around you, and is there a way that you could be doing that better? That's a difficult, that first part of that question is really difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. Connection to the land, because we, we don't walk on it very much anymore. 
we don't have contact with it in the in in the way that when we if we want to speak of the land with any authority, we need to have a better concept of what that means and how we relate to it. And I, that's the big piece for me. It's like, oh, I just walk on sidewalks, you know. So, not very good. Right. The connection's not very close. Yeah. Or it's even it's even not even close. It's removed. It's yeah. it's we're sort of prevented from uh, from accessing the the rhythms of the of the land. It's a good observation. See, my relationship with the land is very different. I my parents still farm, so there's a inherent depth in it. Um, I helped my mom in the garden every spring and fall. Like I help with the weeds. It's there's there's still d dirt in my toenails. Like it's 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 like breathing. I go out there in the pastures. It's something I'm so familiar with. I can find all of the wildflowers I grew up with, but. I think in that I'm removed from my community because it's completely different from my community that I've built as an artist, as a person, like in my surrounding area around my home. It's not connected whatsoever, nor do I know how to connect it. I grew up on a, on a reserve and I went to residential school uh, for a period of seven years, although my time there was broken in between and then my parents returned us. I've walked Saskatchewan for the last four years. Now, I missed last year. And um, we have covered the territory from Murloc, Saskatchewan to Gravelberg. And that's about a 70 mile walk. Uh, we've covered from um, Grasslands to Cypress Hills, and that was another seven, eight day walk. In between that walk from uh, the grasslands, walking across the grasslands, and then driving to um, the Cypress Lake and camping there, and then walking to um, the massacre of the native people at Cypress Hills. So we've walked that. We've also walked from Humble, Saskatchewan to Fort Carlton. And that was 108 miles. I think I'm missing one walk and I can't remember which one it was. But so we've covered a lot of territory in this province. People walk for the history. OK, European settlers walk for the history because it's marked by the RCMP trail. And uh, I walk for the peer pleasure of it. I don't walk to remember history because I would just get mad. I get really angry with that. But I come from a family of walkers on the land. My father was a great hunter, as m both my uh, brothers were. So I'm very, very in touch with the land. Um, I walk every day on our, we have 360 acres of land, so it's a, a, a good walk. So I'm very much in tune and in love with the land, and I've got great, great respect for the environment. And I'm sad for people who live in on concrete because they're out of touch with the spiritual and emotional essence of the land and what what industry is doing to it. So that's those are my thoughts around land. That's great. I don't really feel connected to the land. But ultimately we are connected to the land because we come from the land. And through my teachings and my culture, like, it's Mother Earth. And, um, she gave birth to us as humans to live here, be here. And I guess the only thing I really, when I really feel connected to the land, the way I can really connect to the land is like, it's whenever you like get that really like lonely feeling, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that feeling where you kind of just exist where you are and there's nothing else out of it, you know? You can always just lay down and the like, mother will hold you on the ground. Mm. You know? mm. So that's the way to look at connection. But, but like you said, you don't really walk. Mm. Like we build these structures. We're disconnected from the land. It's also a, um, a, a bigger question. Like I, I worked on farms when I was in high school 
uh, every summer we, my brother and I were sent out and worked on farms. And there's a relationship with the land, but it's in a sense with a specific purpose. So it's like, a so the land is um, uh, controlled, like there's, a, there's an intention with, with all of that land. And, I'm, and yet there, when you look out over the prairie and you're just looking at it, 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 to me, it's amazing just to see it as it is, without a purpose, just its own, whatever <laughs> purpose it has in and of itself. It's, it's a different feeling than relating to it in an economic way. Hmm. And that is a big disconnection in line when you mention it that way. Because you're not looking at the land, as like you said, breathing. You're looking at the land as what it can do for you and mm -hmm. what you can get from the land. You're looking at it as a commodity. You're not looking at it as the life. It's only, yeah, it's, it's, living, it's a living thing in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Part of what I hear then in that is that it's some of what we're experiencing in terms of connection specifically to land is, is it's both the material constructs that are keeping us, but there's also kind of these conceptual constructs mm -hmm. of how, how we view land right. as a resource or a commodity, right. which is different from seeing it as a living thing or as something that has its own existence that apart from what I intend about the right. purpose of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, land, using the term broadly, meaning, you know, the natural environment, yeah supports everything in the world. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the giver of life to everything. Yeah. Um, and I think we have to start looking in a, a much more holistic, yeah. in a much more holistic way about what that means to us. Yeah, because it's kind of weird, like, the land gave birth to us living things, you know, like us living things. But then we looked at the land like it's not alive, most people. Mm -hmm. You know? You see, uh, for me, Land, like my, my connection to land and the meaning of land is, I see Canada as the land of opportunities. It's like mm -hmm. the land that opens the doors to many people who are trying to build a new life. And it, meanwhile, I build a new life in here. Um, also, it comes, it comes with learning about it, learning the connection with, with the culture and ancestors. And to me, meanwhile, I've been learning, I've been finding uh, similarities between indigenous culture and my own culture, like related to family and the connections to, to being a very um, collective culture. I also see the differences and in, in, in start to understand the meaning of my own one, where I come from, and, and how to, I can be disconnected to you depending on my upbringings. And I, I see it's, you know, those. It can be problematic in here too. Like you, you're boring here. Like you walk on sidewalks, like you said. But like, what exactly means this? For for me, Canada is the land that you know. I came here to build a new life. So I'm not a settler, but but I'm also benefiting from from a land that has been you know settled before, and I'm the product of colonization where I come from. So it's just like it's, it has many meanings. And now. Um, that I am having, like I have my own family. I'm starting to understand my relationships, my relationship with indigenous culture because my my kid has indigenous background. She's Métis, so I'm like, how do I connect my own meaning of land and from where I come from with the meaning here in Canada, with their culture and you know the mixture of every culture and trying to understand everything more and how I can also connect it with my own upbringing. Julie, can I ask, would you say that? you have a better appreciation of the land that you come from by being distant from it? Does that make any sense? Yeah. 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 yeah like where I come from, like I, I am a mix where like mestizo. So yeah. which is, it, I think it's similar to Métis, like where we're just, yeah, the, the mix of Spaniards and indigenous and black all in one. That's I think the majority in, in Latin America. So I never grew up having that disadvantage because we're the majority. But moving here, to me, was like, oh, wait, I belong to a different group. You know, it's like the, the majority, the white ones, and the people of color, and everyone. So it's just that, that I understood that I had privilege, and I never knew that. And now moving here, I 
started to understand that there's a lot of dis discrimination and, and disadvantages, systemic and everything, that I never was aware I come from. So mm -hmm. then that made me understand, you know, the problems that we have in my own land by coming into a new land and, yeah, and being part of that disadvantaged group. I, th I think I I have I have always looked for belonging or connection with communities of people wherever I've lived, but haven't necessarily seen the land itself as something to be connected to, unless there was like, oh, when I lived in the Calgary area, I loved going camping in Kananaskis, like the beauty of the mountains, or when I lived in Vancouver, this beach, or Lighthouse Park, or, you know, like there are these, these, these places that were so beautiful, I'd love to go there as a, you know, place to go camping, or, you know. um, and I, at the same time, I've, like, through my, through Kirsten, my wife's uh, extended family, and, and her f farming background, I've sort of, like, become connected to their land in a way that, that now feels like home to me. Um, and I remember when I, when I was like first, <laughs> when I forget if we were engaged already or we were dating, I was working on the farm for my father-in-law and uh, had read some interesting books about um, organic farming versus conventional farming and, 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 and thought these were really good ideas, you know, and, and, and my father-in-law like, just like, you think I'm not caring for the land for long term? Like, you think I don't love this land? I don't see this land as as a commodity. This is like, I am I want seven generations to be able to farm this land. And if I'm treating it in a way that it will continue to be good for, not just for producing crops, but also for wildlife. And they were part of this Buck for Wildlife program that intentionally set a, sets aside a significant portion of land for wetlands and whatnot and it was kind of like oh right okay you i i need to listen more than i talk sometimes you know <laughs> because you read a book <laughs> because i read a book exactly you know yeah yeah hey, it's a great idea to share you know <laughs> um I, I would say over the last uh, recent years and it's maybe more of an aspirational goal but i think the like finding the gifts in the land where I am and say like in the gardens that Kirsten can't help but make in our yard and and every year it's like I think we should turn that into a garden too and it's like the whole <laughs> like we need to have some grass for our kids you know and no it's all going to be garden you know she's anyway um she's a farm girl you know it's, it's, yeah <laughs> but it's it's not. It's not as uh, like let's 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 get something from this. You know, it's like let's dig in the dirt and feel the goodness of it and enjoy the taste of these tomatoes and look at you know had bees in our yard that our friends were were, were keeping and I, I guess I feel like there's a lot more to grow in that, but I I feel much more rooted here on. The Saskatchewan prairies and the South Saskatchewan River Valley and 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 where I think I used to think about well okay I'm connected to these people and I this community would be I'd hate to lose this community if I if I had to move whereas now I feel like I don't want to leave this place and the people and um, I don't so know that, that that that's different for me from past years. So not to shut anything down, and you're welcome to jump in on anything we've shared. But one last question to kind of get us thinking. And this is the long one, but uh, we've done it. We've worded it carefully. So <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the one. Some elders understand the spirit of treaty as adoption, which we explore in this play, as a good way to welcome strangers as family, as all our relations. Yet, we must admit, we've not fulfilled these relationships across these lands called Canada. And in this, season, in this series, We Treaty People, we kind of see an unfinished declaration. 
inviting all of us forward to lean into treaty relationships as one of the many paths toward reconciliation. So with all that said, how has telling this story affected the way and the different ways that you see other people? Or what is the phrase, all my relations, mean to you? Well, a couple things, like we are all treaty people. A European signed a treaty with our people, but it's not respected. And that may, angers me, actually, because there's treaties with different countries, and they respect those treaties. If they didn't, there'd be a war. You know, there's agreements between provinces, between the government and the rest of the provinces. And that's kind of like a treaty and that's respected. What about our treaty? You know, so for that, that, and the other I found interesting was the idea of adoption. I have never thought of uh, adopting the settlers into this country. So that was a, a new twist for me. But in our language, the men will call each, each other joams, joams. And I'm not exactly sure what the translation is. I would have to ask, but it, it, it is a greeting like a relative. The perception is that we are all related and we're all blood relatives because we all come from the stars. And even your European scientists did not claim that. When I was in Ottawa that day I returned, they asked me about truth and reconciliation and the, the greeting. And I, I paused and I said, you know, I don't, I don't mind people acknowledging the land or uh, where the people are from. My response always is, now give it back to us. A hard call, but it's possible to expand. Like, my people are buying back their own land for crying out loud. You know, excuse me, there's something wrong with that picture. If, if the people are saying that acknowledgement, are they living it? Are they living it with you and I, with each other? Are they inviting each other out for dinner to make those, um, I don't like the word bridging, but to make those that relationship happen immediate? Like, let's go out for lunch. Let's, you know, I mean, I love the idea that you folks have had your Bannock um, uh, gathering, for example. That ought to be happening all the time. White men and white women and all of these other uh, visitors ought to be coming to our powwows, to our feasts, to our plays, to our poetry readings, to our, you know, all of that. When I go to uh, a festival, and other, uh, the other Native poets will say, I'm the only brown face there. And with our poetry festivals here in Saskatoon, put by a saucy, I've seen one white face. One white face at our poetry festivals. It's those things that we need to occur. The other thing is, and, and, I, and I witnessed this, I'm in a mixed relationship, my husband's wife. I don't have an issue talking to everybody and anybody, okay? And I will strike up a conversation. It doesn't matter who. Occasionally, occasionally, I have resistance. My, my, my other side of the family, and the, my kids are super, like they're universal people. What I observe with white people is that they're not able to make those kind of connections with the outsider or what they perceive as us as the outsider, you know, which I, I always find interesting. Like, what is the matter with you folks, you know, is my response to that. So, yeah, we have to be much more uh, inviting to, I mean, we all have busy lives. I know my life has been almost unmanageable these last couple of years. But I work at it, you know, I work at it. And, it, and that's what matters. You've got to work at it. Yeah, that's, that's hard to put into words. I suppose it removes the us-them, uh, moves towards removing the, the, the us-them kind of concept. That, that there is, in, in, in fact, uh, people are people. And, uh, and if they are my, rel my relations, then I must treat them as I would treat someone in my own immediate family. It's interesting, like, 
That question makes me think, well, well, you said we have to re-examine the way we're going about things because, you know, we're creatures of routine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then we've just been routinely not educating the population on what a treaty right is. Even reading that play was difficult mm -hmm. at times because a lot of these views on treaty rights and the views on what it was because are they're like talking points mm -hmm. you know which touches back to the land being a commodity and thinking this is the land this is what it is because right. um, we never were owners of the land right. like we migrated and moved um, and that's a big misunderstanding of I, I've been thinking lately about intelligence mm -hmm. to think that we are above a bird or above a, an ant I mean if you're thinking about life and itself and DNA and the whole root of to keep your genetic code going, the smartest way to do that is to become symbiotic with the land you are living on. Not build structures on it, not morph the land, but to live with the land. Mm -hmm. So when you look at these birds, and like they've been around for millions of years, you cannot look at them like they're lesser. You're not intelligent. Because they figure it out. In order to live the longest, here you have to have a symbiotic nature with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the effect. Like when, when people talk of treaty rights, what is the effect of that on me as opposed to what effect does it have on you? For me, I go, well, you know, treaty rights, okay, good, fine. What effect does it have on me? I, I, don't, I don't even recognize the effect that it has on me. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the miseducation of it. Yeah, because people don't understand the effect that the tree right has on you is the fact that you are here in Canada, right. working. Yeah. yeah, you were born here, and we get gain the benefits from that. And yeah. you're benefiting. You were living and benefiting on the land, and the part that is hard and tough is the manipulation that the government does through not correcting anything. Like, for instance, it's they're protecting this lie. In the most nuanced way, like where you can, where, where you can't say they are, because they would say, well, we're not. Because if they wanted to really take a step forward to show the truth and to re reconcile, they would say not one penny of your tax dollars goes to treaty rights. Not one. Mm -hmm. And that is always a massive Massive talking point of the Conservative Party, right? mm. Conservative people, liberals, like anybody, they, they think that they, it's, they, they breed this ignorance because it helps them and their war that they're still fighting with us natives. Mm. So it makes truth and reconciliation and treaty rights and, and that question just think. Mm. They're not, it's not a thing, it's an idea, it's, it's a veneer, you know. Right. It's a veil. It's what you want. But then, to be really honest, it's really cool to see. And I see these young Native people and Native people my age and getting really hyped and excited. And the, the darkest part of it all is we have to be very careful. And you find out in the, in the play, because the crown could just take away the land mm. and put us back in cages, in residential schools. And, and that sounds far-fetched, but it isn't because there's kids in cages in Mexico and there's the Uyghur Muslims in China. It is, there's stuff mm -hmm. is going on right. today. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And it could just happen to us natives. And as much as I believe you guys say you wouldn't let that happen, you know? Well, the fear is real, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. I didn't smoke. I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's real. It's, it's uh, we talk about the politeness of Canadian society. You know, it's Canadian society, and we we say um, we say sorry all the time, right? And like, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> but then do we say we, sorry as we turn the key in the lock? It's kind of. I'm so sorry about this. I'm so sorry about yes. this. Our sorry holds as much weight as the truth and reconciliation idea itself. Like, it's something we say. If if. You're going to perform an action you need to be sorry for. Maybe you shouldn't be performing that action. Yeah, and you can see that blatantly. 
when um, those commercial fishermen mm-hmm. looted and burned and mm-hmm. robbed that yeah, fishery yeah. Yeah. for the Mi'kmaq treaty rights, mm-hmm. uh, the RSMP stood by, and this is why we have to be careful, because it was just being filmed and watched. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then some people pulled down John A. McDonald's statue. The law is the law, as Trudeau said, the next day. Mm-hmm. What's his big, you know, yeah. countrywide speech. Mm-hmm. Conservative party just, oh, you can't do this. The law is open. Where, where, the, where was the law? Just last week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then that fuels ignorance and hate. Yeah. And they don't properly educate what a treaty right is and how you guys are treated, how we are treated. Mm-hmm. That's why mm-hmm. it is to us. Yeah. Which is why I respect the diligence he took mm. and um, burning, taking burning. Which puts the onus, I mean, as an example, that puts the onus on us to, to learn it. If we're not being taught it, we need to learn it. True, yeah, and that's the responsibility. Mm-hmm. All I can say is that like, my, my kid who's in kindergarten honestly knows more than, uh, than, than I do at times about it. Because the, the school he goes to, they tell him about things and he's telling about we had a conversation in the car today about treaties being promises because of the treaty belts from a show he was watching and so like he's he's learning things so i feel like if there's there's something there that there is some education starting i know it's so it's a five-year-old and what does that matter but but to me it does it's because it's like this is how you can move forward it shows me that there is progress because he was, uh, he, he takes, he's got Cree every, uh, a couple times a week. And so he knows a couple of Cree words. And, uh, and he's like, how come you don't know it, Dad? And I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, honestly, and I'm honest with him. I'm like, honestly, when I was a kid, nobody cared. Yeah. And I said that. And, that. and it's good that, like, people are trying to learn and care more and treat each other better. And it gives me this kind of, like, a bit of hope. To, to say that, uh, like at least, at least if he cares and I care, and my house cares, maybe it, maybe there's something to it. But you know, that, that goes back to the, one of the questions earlier <clears throat> about community. It's like your house, the people in your house care. It's one house, one yard, a little fence, a dog, but that still makes a difference. It, it, it has to, otherwise we are. We there is no hope if that one person can't make a difference. There's a lot of one people that care and want to see that change. Mm-hmm. If it were zero, we're doomed. But it's not. There's a lot. We just there's more steps that need to be taken. And then like the kids, the next generation, they're going to be taking more steps than we knew possible because we're we're still learning we're still we're still figuring it out what this treaty means for us yeah that and that like like you said that the shift from us us and them whoever whoever your us is right we we all come from different different communities and different kind of cultural backgrounds um but i i know for for me this like adoption image it makes the all my relations feels like I thought I, I used to see that phrase like oh that's a really cool indigenous idea about like all the I thought it was most about all my all the humans right yeah like we're all oh it's actually all the all of the animals and oh it's actually also the earth and it's everything that mm-hmm. that is we're we're some we're related to and I and I I totally like resonate with that in terms of even like if Creator, Mother Earth, like like we're 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 relatives, <clears throat> but adoption as like no, we're actually family. We're not just like <clears throat> yeah, we're related because we're like part of the same species or we're all part of the same yeah. ecosystem. It's like, but if we're actually family, like it doesn't. I'm not like I can't be let off the hook. It's one thing is like well those people them yeah. or or like well these people those people need to they're trying to find their rights and they're fighting and that that's good that's good but it's totally different if it's like my cousins or 
that that's my my auntie mm -hmm. who went through residential school yeah. not like those people or something you know and yeah. and my my kids too are like they're they're all in grade nine to grade five right right now but yeah. it's been a gift to see them learning more of the real history and like on the orange shirt day we were at the the, the uh, walk and the, the celebration commemoration down at uh, um, Victoria Park and, and afterwards we were walk, walking back to the car and my my son asked me I guess he, he said he said I love I love the powwow drums I'm like I do too I, I, I love it and, and he, he was like he was like my band teacher was saying like when she she grew up she grew up just outside of Saskatoon and she told the class this week she was like I never heard powwow drums live until I was already teaching high school. And she was talking about why was that and, and you know why. And he was like, I've grown up, I know, I've grown up in drumming. I've, I've gotten to be part of the indigenous ensemble. And I was like, that's so great that that's like, this is just like, this is part of what you, you know to mean this is what it means to be in Canada, to be on the, hmm. in Saskatchewan. And I was like, I, I didn't hear a powwow drumming live till 2014 myself. He was like, "What?" I was like, "Yeah, I went to Wanaskay when a powwow was like my first time, and it's very foreign to me." But now it's like I love it. I like, I want to learn to play it. I'm like, I don't know. I yeah, I just. Well, I I want to talk about a first experience I had too on an orange shirt day. My wife and I um, were taking part of the in the walk downtown. This is two or three years ago, and we were biking on our way home, and I had the first racist epithets thrown in my direction. I've never had comment before because, you know, I'm a white guy. But because we were wearing orange shirts, huh. these guys riding by in a truck were going, oh, nice shirt you got, you pig. And I was getting all of, my wife and I were getting all of this, this nonsense, huh. and I just went, holy crap. And and I, I can't imagine what it what it would be like if we didn't have white faces. It's just the shirts that got the comment. I just went, this is this is crazy because I was pissed. I was very very upset, as as was my wife. But that's the first time anyone's ever thrown a racist stone at me. Hmm. You see, I wonder if that like because now like you said like. Um, because me, in my education, everyone my age, I'm 39, so everyone my age and older has been taught what I was taught mm -hmm. in school, which was uh, the Europeans discovered Canada, came here, found us savages, went to war with us, obliterated us, and then took pity on us and gave us our treaty rights. Mm -hmm. So that's the history I was taught in school. It's probably a logical word, and it's it's good to see that they're talking now. Mm -hmm. But then it's almost like the, the cynical part of me is it going to create a divide? Mm. A divide where? Like, like the, the young young people and the older. I mean, there is now. I mean, we play that. We play a game. <laughs> we play my a game with my family at holidays, which is. How long until someone says something irredeemable? <laughs> like, and it's like, Grandma. And then you got to be like, you can't, we, and I have to, I have to educate my grandma. So there is a divide, right? And the divide, it happens. It's like, that's the, the old guard at times. And it, it is, it is within each unit, right? And that where that, where that divide is, sometimes it isn't there. It's not there with my wife's family, mm. right? Like they're all on the same page. I right. come from a different stock right. of right. Canadian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, I think generally though, that <laughs> the, the change is causing a great deal of tension. Sure. Yeah. We are experiencing mm -hmm. that tension yeah. Yeah. virtually, well, internationally, it's happening everywhere. Change, yeah. is, change is very difficult for some people. And that's why mm -hmm. I believe in them, like, on the, all like, me being indigenous and artist, um, it kind of sucks because <laughs> I ha I do have a responsibility mm. and I kind of don't want that I just like to be known as an artist instead of an indigenous artist mm -hmm. everywhere I am labeled right, right. Yeah. 
you know, everything is an indigenous indigenous singer, an indigenous writer, an indigenous actor. I'm not just a singer, I'm not just a writer, I'm not just an actor. I'm yeah. indigenous. Yeah. But it's it's really it's really strange because it's 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 backwards but forwards. Putting labels yeah. on people is what caused a lot of the yeah. But then here we are putting labels on people to make it better. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. Mm. So it's complicated. We have no answers. We have right. lots of questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But, but we still have responsibilities. Yeah. And maybe, yeah, maybe that's the biggest thing that I'm, to identify something I'm hearing is as we hear and are willing to hear more of the truth and lean in when these hard tensions emerge, which is some of what <clears throat> I think we've discovered in a lot of the conversations we've had here and some of what Yvette has encouraged us is when the conversation is hard or there's something that's, uh, it's like, don't lean back, which is our tendency, but lean in so that you can hear across that difference. And the more that we're willing to do that and be uncomfortable when we've been used to being comfortable and not mm. get racist stuff thrown at us, the, the further we can go in understanding our, each other across difference and not just have to label and let that be the comfortable way I understand, but can actually find a way to, to live together in a place. And so that that notion of all my relations doesn't remain an abstraction, but it's concretely enacted here with the people in the room, with the land that I'm on. Yeah, it's great. I was going to say it was very interesting what you said, Lance, um, about the labeling, because my father-in-law grew up hiding his indigenous status because of you know embarrassment and shame. Mm -hmm. And now he's just so proud and he just screams it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and then me as an outsider, I always find it interesting because I'm like, well, how are you trying to amend all those, you know, all those things in the family? And it's just this is a divide in the family and that side where like some of them are like, well, you hit, you hit it for so long. Like what makes you think now you want to carry the label so high? And then... The other side of the family is like, well, we are amending our mistakes. And it's interesting how you grew up with a label, and you're like, why do I have to have a label? Meanwhile, them, they're like, we want the label now. So it's just, it's very complicated. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. It's weird. It's weird, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I just sit there and watch and try to understand how they're like, just like, I want the label. And the other ones are like, no, I don't. That's okay. You know, live without the label. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. I suppose it's a personal. If if that's a choice that you make, that's your choice. Mm -hmm. So long as somebody else isn't making a choice for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and then touch on what you said about you go to these family dinners and you're at a point where it's like, well, how long is it going to be till someone says something irredeemable? And I guess that's like a responsibility of you as an individual. Not like, to, obviously, you're not going to correct your grandma. She's like so stuck in her ways. Sometimes we do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We had a great conversation about residential schools, and I actually she made some progress, <laughs> which will be undone by other people or by other Facebook. family members. But like, uh, she's she's my one where I'm like, I bet I can. She's 88. I think we can get her. <laughs> <laughs> and she's she's not. She watches CBC News, well, and yay. she doesn't know how computers work. So she's. <laughs> Still savable as far as I'm concerned. Like she doesn't have a Facebook to spew hate. Mm -hmm. And like I guess <laughs> there's hope. And there's still... the, the responsibility I guess for you would be to explain to the younger kids in your family that that is not a correct way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. And explain, no, no. explain why it is and why it is the way it is. Mm -hmm. That'd be like that's a responsibility that someone themselves can take on their own as yeah. to make it a better place for everybody. Yeah. I do want to respect everyone's time. Is there any, are there any final thoughts of burning things that have kind of popped out for anybody? I, I, I was thinking about your thing, about, well, but, but one, one person, one family, I don't know if you're familiar with <clears throat> Bowen family system theory. You can look it up. It's worth looking at, though. <laughs> but, like, in a family system, and there's anxiety, and there's, mm -hmm. like, people try to triangulate other people to reduce the anxiety and, and, put, and make the tension go away. And it, it just takes one person to, to, to say, no, actually, I'm going to be true to myself and be differentiated, but still be in relationship and stay connected to, to you. 
and be a calming, non-anxious presence in the midst of other people's anxiety and conflict, that that one person can really turn down the heat in the family system and, like, offer a way out of this, like, stuckness. We have to play these roles and everybody tries to just keep the tension away and I don't know how that works in terms of a large family like a nation, but if we're all family, you know, you you would try to stay stay in a relationship and work it out. You know? The family, as the, my thought behind it is always, the, you don't have to like them. You don't have to like mm -hmm. your family, but you, you're supposed to love them mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. because mm -hmm. there's that connection, and I think that's... I always had this thing where it was like, well, no one else can beat up my brother except for me because he's my brother. Right? <laughs> that's how you rule your family. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I want that, you know, that's, I think that's, like if we are all a family, because we are all a family, we you don't have to like each other, but we, we do have to at least like love each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's just like kids. Sometimes you love your kid, but sometimes you don't have to like your kid. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> It's good that you know that now. <laughs> Especially when they're cheating. I can't wait for cheating in your years. There's days you look at that six month old and you're like, oh, you pay rent. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody. Yeah. I think it's to honor the time and we've had. I, I thank you all. It's been great to chat. It's great to, mm -hmm. to see this work come to realization. And uh, yeah. Thanks for being part of the final show for We Treat People. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We Treaty People is a production of Burnt Thicket Theatre. Support our work with a donation and learn more about the artists at burntthicket.com. And check out our website or the episode description for links to other great learning resources. Special thanks go to the Canada Council for making this project possible. And to our season sponsors, Surecom Industries and SK Arts. This work was gratefully created on Treaty 6 territory and on the traditional homeland of the Métis.